Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas, um, ML engineer at Weights and Biases here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, long time no see. And I want to present to you something about my work as a daily Weights and Biases user and a machine learning engineer and an ML company. Um, my talk is called Iterating Fast to Improve Your Baselines. Um, this is something that, that we face a lot as ML engineers. Um, we need to to try something new and you want to iterate fast so you can get the best out of your machine learning pipelines. So recently, um, Jeremy Howard, if you don't know Jeremy Howard, he's the founder of Fast AI, this amazing uh, PyTorch based library and community that has been improving machine learning for a while now. Um, if you haven't heard from him, like I encourage you to follow him on Twitter and and go ahead and go to fast.ai and, and check the content he's creating. But he often like leaves by this approach of iterating fast and and like spanning a cluster of multi GPU training and 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 just running a huge um, training process that that may fail because you didn't debug it correctly. For me, is a no brainer. And he's always going through this process of of trying to find ways to, to get rapid feedback from your code, from your metrics, and, and being able to, to assess if your, your idea is working straight away or not. So recently, uh, late last year, he was working on his recent fast AI course and looking for a data set for, to, to showcase how to train a classifier to the students. And yeah, he, he went on fashion mints. Fashion mints is this, um, small data set. I will go, I will explain you later. But he 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 just poses this question to the audience, like, can we train fashion men's for 20 epochs? Um, what, what's the best we can get in 20 epochs? Um, so, okay, if, I'm, I'm pretty excited about these types of like challenges. So I took the challenge and I was like, okay, let's, let's try to make the best possible model in 20 epochs. That's something I can manage. It's, in a, in a modern GPU that should be pretty fast and I can iterate fast. So I'm going to show you how I approach this problem from a pure PyTorch point of view, like um, a super simple training script and then complexify the script, instrument weights and biases into the script and, and manage to have hundreds of experiments and analyze the results all together. So Fashion Mens is this small data set that was created by Salandu Research. It's, it's just 10 classes of clothing in super small size black and white images. So it's a fast data set that you can train even without GPU. 60,000 images for the training set. And the validation data set is, is 10,000 images. So go ahead and, and check Fashion Mens you haven't. Um, so basically, how, how does it work? Like you go, you download your data set, you, you, you find someone else script on the internet and, and you start training something and you create your baseline. If you are like me and you like Jupyter Notebooks, you create your baseline, IPy Notebook, and you start from that. Quickly, you realize that hmm, I can make some improvements on my baseline and, and you end up with baseline version two, like because yeah, it's better than baseline V1. But you want to keep track of baseline one just in case. Then you realize that mm, the naming maybe, yeah, I should I should probably improve the learning, learning rate. So I'm, I'm going to keep track of the learning rate I changed. So you end up having a new baseline file that has like the learning rate appended to the name. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, this can escalate pretty quickly. You try a new bigger ResNet because why not ResNets? Bigger the rest of the bigger the model normally works better. And yeah, but you 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 forgot to track the error metric you were you were trying to minimize. So you also dropped there the error metric. Then you realize you're in Windows and they don't like dots in your nine files. So you replace all the dots by underscores and you end up with this Frankenstein naming convention. Yeah. So at the end, you rename everything final because this is your final version. But uh, you don't remember there's an untitled 146 notebook somewhere there that maybe has something useful. You commit that all together. Um, this is fine if you are pretty organized and, and, and you keep track of all that somewhere, but it has to be a better way of doing that. 
So for me, that is weights and biases. Weights and biases is a tool that it's a system of record that enables you keep track of all your experiments in a single place, a single dashboard and workspace to, to put everything together, all the training scripts, all the logs, or everything that has been executed by your, your team or yourself. And how does it work? Basically, it enables you to exactly do what we are trying to do today. That's rapidly iterate. Then if you come back sometime later, you can easily reproduce the same experiment you were running a couple of months ago that you forgot how to run and enables you to collaborate with more people. So you can share your results in an organized way or make other people collaborate with runs and experiments in your own projects. So yeah, that's weights and biases. It's a pretty um, accelerated summary, but I, I will actually show you how I will solve this fashion mint problem in my weights and biases way. Um, if you want to know more about weights and biases in general, I encourage you to take a look at the weights and biases courses. Um, we have been actively developing more content into this, and we go exactly through this process of like EDA, a, EDA a new problem, creating a baseline, refactoring, uh, running hyperparameter search in, in a very structured way. I'm, a, I'm one of the instructors of the courses, so if you need want any feedback, please come back to me. I'm available on Twitter or in the Weights and Biases Discord. So also another small promotion. We have a fully connected conference. This is our own Weights and Biases conference coming on March 15. And please, please come. Uh, it's, it's a full day event organized for member practitioners. We have a lot of guest speakers. With Jeremy Howard will be there, interviewed by Lavania. That's going to be really awesome. So I encourage you to, to join if you haven't seen. So let's turn off the presentation and switch to Visual Studio Code because this is a workshop. So let's go technical here. So as I told you before, I most of the time start with a notebook. Um, the notebook, let's call that baseline01.ipynb. Um, this code lives here in in my GitHub Fashion Mint repo, it's it's a pretty minimal code, um, nothing fancy here. But if you want to try to run this code yourself, I encourage you to go to github.com, take a pal, Fashion Mint, F Mint, and you will have, this is the baseline we are running today. So I'm going to go through the cells quickly here. Um, just to be transparent, this is connected to a, to a V100 machine. So if you want to iterate fast, as I say in the name of the Prezo, like you will probably want a GPU. <laughs> Not something fancy, but a V100 or, or a GTX, a GeForce will do. So yeah, this is pretty standard PyTorch code. I'm not using any fancy library. The only fancy is the, where I'm using team for getting like pre-trained architectures. Oh, sorry, um, models. So yeah, we, we will read images. I have computed the, the metric, the, the mean and standard deviation of the data set, standard torch vision transform, nothing fancy, just horizontal flip. Um, I'm just saving that into a dictionary. Just you will understand why this is important later on. Some basic configuration parameters, like if you have GPU, use it. Um, number of workers, how many workers you want on the data loader, the batch size, maybe reduce that if you don't have a big GPU. And then getting the data, uh, Torch Vision enables you to download fashion means directly, and then creating just a train and validation data loader. Be sure to, to use the, the actual test set for the validation data loader. A good starting point is always ResNet 18. Um, it's fast, it's, it's good enough, and why not? Um, so we get a ResNet 18. Important for this benchmark is not getting a pre-trained model because this is how fast we can train, um, how accurate we can train on a fixed amount of epochs, a backbone. What, what's the best model we can get in 20 epochs or five epochs? It will depend. We'll start with five epochs, but the actual, um, challenge is with, is with 20. Then number of classes, uh, team is pretty flexible, so it enables you to, to pass black and white images if you pass in channels equals to one. Some hyperparameters for our optimizer, we will use Adam W is same as Adam, but with decouple weight decay. 
um, some metrics. We want to compute actual uh, validation accuracy. That's the metric we are trying to optimize here. This is Torch eval. Um, it's like Torch metrics. It's, it's a metrics library for Torch. Um, and then like, I, I like to actually format my code this way. I have a training step that's basically zeroing the grads and computing backward pass. And then I, I like to create a function that does one ebook at a time. So if we're on training, we put them all to train or eval and then like grab a batch, compute them all predictions. We will store them. You will, I will show you why afterwards. We compute the loss function, just simple cross entropy here. And we, we, we update the losses and the metrics so we can keep track of that later on. Then if we are on training, we go for the training step. We compute our accuracies. If we're on the validation, we compute the validation accuracy. And then, um, and this, this one epoch returns the predictions and the loss. We can check that this thing works by running this. It takes like five seconds on one of 100. Just run it once just to show you. Perfect. And then we want to do a training loop. So basically um, the training loop is this. So for a number of epochs, we do one epoch of training. And after each epoch of training, we do one epoch of validation. And I have created like this print with formatting. That's it's pretty horrible, but it gets you something that looks like this. So five epochs in this machine takes more or less 30 seconds. So that's pretty fast, uh, I would say. This can be accelerated even further if you go to for mixed precision training and maybe accelerated data loaders like FFCV. I think it can be accelerated up to like two seconds per epoch. But for me, this is OK without complexifying the code unnecessarily. Um, so here we go, like our super simple baseline, like five epochs, 0.9. That's not bad. So not bad relative to what? So relative to this, if we go to fashion minced in papers with code, we can we can see the fashion minced leatherboard for different papers and basically realize that, yeah, we have a bunch of like, this is error rates. I'm, I'm showing accuracy. So this is one minus that. So 4% error rate is 96% accuracy. But if you click on any of those papers, this is for 200 epochs, a huge model in general with a lot of augmentation. So our super simple baseline without any single trick, it's 90%. So I will say it's fair enough. Okay, before continuing, um, do you realize that now we wanna try multiple things to, to try to get closer to what Jeremy is asking. Um, we can open the tweet and actually this is a pretty long thread um, and people are reporting like 94, 95, people are working here. So you can see like people are answering the Jeremy's call. I, I even try like running multiple. I will not spoil you, but yeah, I, I got more close to 94% um, without much tweaking. Um, so, if we start modifying this, we will override this and we'll need to like duplicate this guy, create a copy. And, but instead of doing that, we will, we will actually create a copy that has weights and biases instrumented in. So we will call this baseline with 1db and we can call that 02. So, oh, sorry, I, I removed the dot there, that's it. So, Initially, I will, what I would do is, is, is I would move um, the parameters that are important for this experiment up to the top of the notebook. Um, how do I do that in general? There are multiple ways of doing that. A, a plain dictionary will do, but I, I really like the simple namespace. So I will probably do something like this. Um, and with some luck, Copilot will fill this for us. Actually, it's exactly what I want to do. Uh, learning rate, weight decay should be there. Uh, that should be it. So I like simple namespace. Um, yeah, we have to import that guy. Um, some types import simple namespace. 
And why I like simple namespace? Because simple namespace is like a data class, but kind of simpler. Um, and so you can then call uh, um, attributes by dot. So you have you can call them like properties, and you don't have to do like a dictionary style calling that it's like brackets, string, whatever. So this is something I I, I find really useful. Then um, probably what you also want to do is keep track of this transform. So probably in the config, you should add transforms here. Um, so now the config, it's, it contains the transforms. Um, so you don't keep track because if we put some more fancier transforms, like we will want to be able to reproduce that in the future. So yeah. Probably some of those parameters can also be moved up. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just do this here, and then I will show you the refactor script because we don't have time to actually do this by hand. So probably this is something we don't need anymore. And we can put um, another meta parameter here, like num workers uh, for some reason. OK. So yeah, then another cool thing to do in general is um, is refactor this as like get data or something that depends on the data path. Um, yeah, the transform, the batch size and the number of workers. Yeah, Copilot is really smart. Like he's actually doing the work for us. So we can delete all that. So now like um, grabbing the data is just doing this. We can call it with with all the parameters. So data path. Yeah, copilot knows what to do. So why we do that? Because now everything is parametric on the config. So if we change the config or any of the config parameters, the script execution changes. So let me show you how the how it work, how it looks when it's refactored. Um, basically, it's I put everything on a train.py file. So it depends on the sing on the simple namespace as before. Um, I actually don't put the num num workers and and data path here because that's machine dependent, and I'm not changing machine for this experimentation. Um, don't look at that yet. Um, basically, it's the same I showed you before. I like to refactor stuff into a class um, so I can keep track of stuff like the device and the model, so I, I don't need to be hanging around those parameters uh, in the global scope. Um, as you can see, everything, the, the definition is is down here, and I have like a, a handy from team meta that creates one of these objects from the model name. Data loader, same as before. This is like a, a all the, all the configuration parameters for the optimization. Um, I call compile just to please my Keras friends, but um, Keras calls compile when you basically define the optimization parameter of your model. And one could actually, yeah, put um, a fancier configuration here, like um, passing different optimizers, different um, schedulers, and even different loss functions. But let's keep it simple. And with this, this without touching any of this and only the internal parameters, we get actually pretty good results already. The training steps, same as before. Um, yeah, I'm just adding a scheduler step here. As you can see, the one one epoch training loop is the same. The only thing that changed is that we are now adding this small line that when you compute your metrics and the important quantities you are interested in, we log them to weights and biases. So that's the only change you need to make here in your training script to use weights and biases. So weights and biases is just a Python library. So we import weights and biases, import 1db here, and then we go in the code and in the places where we are computing the relevant metrics for our training, we log them to weights and biases. How do you log them? You call 1db log and you pass a dictionary with the name of the metric you are logging and the value you are logging. So um, in the training step, you are interested in getting the training loss and maybe the learning rate if you're using a scheduler. This way we can keep track of the evolution of the learning rate. Um, and then, um, don't look at that, but 
when you go fit, after doing the one epoch train, we can log that the accuracy, the accuracy of the full um, data set, because you need to compute that accumulated accuracy. And then like we also log the value of the epoch to tra keep track of what epoch we are at. And after doing validation, we compute the validation loss and the validation accuracy. This is the metric we will be looking forward. And then like we can just put everything together into a main file, this into a main uh, function that calls, creates fashion trainer from these parameters. And then we define the optimizer parameters and then we call trainer fit. And the only thing you need to do is call that before calling, um, after calling weights and biases in it, 1db in it, this will create an experiment for you. So what does it mean? Um, it means that, let me show you, let me create a terminal here. Oh, I already had one. We can go here and call train.py. When you do that, um, this code gets executed. Um, basically we call main.config. Um, and it's creating fashion trainer, compiling it, and then running one experiment. Oh, I have an error here. Line 154. Yeah, I refactor this. I remove some of this boilerplate here yesterday. And my bad. Let's run that again. It failed because, yeah. The class fashion trainer does not have a log method. So when you do that, um, you get a lot of like pretty colorful printing from weights and biases. Um, it's kind of a little bit overwhelming, but basically it's telling you like, hey, um, you are actually logged as Cape Cape. That's my username. And we will be creating a new experiment for you called Solar Lion. And we will be logging that to weights and biases, Cape Cape, and fashion means.pt. Oh. So that's what those parameters name. Yeah, the project and the entity are here. So this is where the, pro the, the runs and the experiments will go. And this is the user you will be using to log your, your experiments to. This becomes really relevant when you are working on a team or on a project with someone else, like you can put the team name here and, and log to that team. So that finished, once you finished, um, yeah, we get the same printing as before, but we get some summary metrics like on ASCII format here. Uh, we get the relevant metrics and we get a link to click on. When you click this link, yeah, open it, save. Um, you get to the project work base. And as you can see, every single parameter we log gets its own little graph. So yeah, learning rate went one cycle here. Accuracy went up. Validation accuracy went up. Five epochs for X amount of steps. We can get some info on this run. It ran on a Tesla V100. Um, the script was train.py. It also takes like a snapshot of the GitHub repo where the, the Git repo where you were running your code from. So in, in case you need to keep track of what you were doing, um, you can go back with this hash. Um, so Everything you put into this simple namespace gets locked here pretty nicely. Um, the batch size, the device, even the transforms get rendered as text, but you know exactly what transforms were on when you run this experiment. So if we go back to the project page, um, right now our project page has two runs, one that failed and the one that, that went well. This is, this is pretty standard. If we switch to table view here, we have fail runs, crash runs. It, you don't have to get, be discouraged with that. Sometimes you forget to add parameters to log and you ended up like adding it at the last minute. So that's not a problem. Um, what happened if I rerun the same Python script again? Um, let's do that quickly. And then I will show you like the results of the experimentation. If you rerun this experiment again, um, weights and biases treats that as a new experiment. It's like, hey, you're running this code. I don't know if it's new or old. I will do the same as before. Um, check the git state and rerun this code and create you a new run for you. So we put this fancy name so you you don't get lost. But you can you can change that if you are creative with names. But believe me, you get 
creativity is is, is pretty short <laughs> when you have to name like one thousand runs. So if we go back to the workspace now, we get a new run coming in, and now everything gets alienated. So you see that, yeah, both runs were more or less the same. Yeah, everything is not seated, so they look almost identically, but they are not. Um, so imagine if you want to try multiple parameters, architectures, go for the ResNet 150 something or the new context, whatever, um, you can end up with a, a weights and bases space with a lot of runs. And let me show you the results of my of my training here. Um, yeah, actually, when I run this experiment, I run it in in fashionmins.pt, but in a team on a team. We have a fast AI team where, <laughs> and gratefully, Jeremy is in. Uh, come on, internet. Yeah, we have some people in here, like a creative team, a Jeremy, some other fast AI developers. Um, it's a private team, but we are using it for when we do fast AI stuff. And as you can see, uh, I run like, I don't know, 48 runs here. And yeah, I improve a lot. Uh, I started by, um, so here we can see that they are sorted by validation accuracy here. We can sort them descendingly here. And yeah, I got a bunch of runs up to 90. It's not easy to get to 94, like I encourage you to try. Um, this one is, is like, um, it's, it's just for reference because um, this one ran for longer than what it's um, the benchmark for. It's 200 epochs. I was just making sure that we can actually go to 94. Um, but then I, sometime later, I went to 94 with, a, with this run here. Um, so you can go back here, check the parameters I was using. This is still using a super small ResNet. Actually, bigger rest nets for this problem tend to overfit. And then when I'm ready, what I actually do with weights and biases is I create a report. So a report is this like um, glorified markdown where you can export everything that you have achieved with your experiments and organize them in a, in a nice way. So I put an intro of what we're doing here, um, a small description of fashion means data set, I log some of the images. You can actually log images to weights and biases. And so here we can visualize them. I log the baseline. Uh, actually, my, my baseline, my orig original baseline was better than the one I show you here um, because this one trained for 20 ebooks. So 20 ebooks from this file gets you more or less to 0.92. And another cool trick, I don't have time to show you, but it's, it's on the code. Um, you can log more predictions. Um, alongside input. So here you can see that um, I'm, 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 I'm logging a table and I'm looking at where the labels are different from the prediction. So where the model is getting wrong. Um, and then when I do that, I can see that, I don't know, like um, we are getting 122 wrongs here. Um, and basically it's, it's yeah, it's confusing t-shirts and, and dresses. And my best model went here. So I can share this with other people. This is leaves on the internet, or you can share that internally with your team. Um, you can use your own tuners. Um, we have our own, like, I got a question that people ask me if I can use my own tuners. Tuners, I suppose you're talking about parameter optimizers, um, like hyperparameter tuning. Yeah, you can use Optuna, for instance, and it has a weights and biases callback then. So you can pipe your experimentation from Optuna and log them to weights and biases. I actually did, um, as you can see here, I try running an hyperparameter sweep for this experiment, but I was not getting very good results. Maybe I didn't try. I was just trying model, model names, just trying the small models from team. And yeah, uh, uh, small models tend to work best for this. And then I realized there were even smaller models like ResNet 10T and and that. So yeah, that's that's what I wanted to show you today. Um, it's pretty fast, I know, but a, a quick um, showcase of how I use weights and biases for solving an actual problem. Um, 
Um, there is a lot of to be done on tiny ML workspace like this, like finding good recipes for training models from scratch is something that's not yet solved. And I encourage you to try this um, uh, on, on, on Fashion Mints or another example of yours. Um, can you, yeah, you can select your 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 best model programmatically. Here I selected it manually, but yeah, you can do it programmatically. You can actually query the weights and biases Python with Python and, and ask the API, hey, give me the best model um, fr from a given metric. So yeah, um, I think if we don't have more questions. Another question comes from Yeah, rendering on the UI, people are asking me for long names of metrics. Sometimes you get truncated. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of edge cases about, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, this type of feedback is really valuable. Please, please um, fill a ticket or or ask on the weights and biases community Discord. Um, we love we love this type of feedback. We we give this type of feedback internally all the time um, when we find these edge cases. Yeah, um, the people are asking me all the registry, and that will be all after that. Um, yeah, we have a model registry, so you can actually log the train model to weights and biases, and then you will have this UI that enables you to to tag them and 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 mark them as like candidate for deployment or not and and give admit data like it's like a model card and you can share this among a team so you can share models with other people in your organization 